Okay, let's see here. Um, Sunday school. So, uh, prayer requests. My friend Dottie, Dottie, she calls me every Sunday morning to let me know what she would do or how I'm not. And she's, she's not real good. And she would love to be here. But she also told me that the 12th of August is her birthday. And it would be nice if maybe someone would send a birthday card to her just to come here and encourage her. Right. And it's the same address as mine. Only well, she's an apartment nine. They took it over minus six. <laughs> she's apartment nine. How's Tim doing? Well, he seems to be doing okay. We're going to go, my daughter Lana and I are going to go see him tomorrow. We have an appointment at 1. Oh, but, good. But uh, he knows that now the visiting thing's been extended till August, the end of August, whatever that is. Now, well, it's going to be extended until at least November 4th, too. Uh, yeah, no kidding. But, you know, in the meantime, they can't get their foot doctors and all that in there to take. Yeah, that's yeah. absurd. It is. It, it really is. I mean, his is just toenails, but you know, they get the diabetics and stuff in there. They need foot care, and it's just a mess, and I'm venting, sorry. That's okay. Because then they wouldn't let him back in. started this week? Did he get to watch those? Or no, listen to them? No. Well, at least I don't think so. They started yesterday, right? Yeah, it's <clears throat> Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, okay. Yeah, they played two games. Check on that. Yeah, I didn't know if he was able to listen to them. Or well, there's this thing, they got that radio, like some radio thing, and it shuts off for whatever reason after five or ten minutes. And then they tell him, well, you can turn it back on with your voice. Well, he doesn't seem to think that, he says that doesn't work. You know, it's just frustrating. If I can get in there, <laughs> I can do some of this stuff. You know? Right, but right. I think I've taken care of him for 30 years. I kind of know what to do. Right. Ah. Okay, I'm done. Well, I was, I kind of chuckled to myself Wednesday night. We were praying with some of the men, and somebody prayed for Ted Turner. Oh, <laughs> I'm he's thinking. A, he's a famous guy. Isn't he? Well, he owns what? TNT and yeah. CNN and yeah. all them, you know, the Atlanta Braves. Yep. But they were trying to pray for your husband, yeah. <laughs> and they just mentally just mess, messed it up. Messed it up. Well, at least they, they knew what they meant. Yeah, they yeah. Meant. But maybe God also accounted it for Ted Turner, too. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. Who knows? Um. <clears throat> In case you didn't hear, uh, Tiffany Nichols had her baby uh, Friday night, and uh, I guess we were going over there for dinner, like planned, and she went into labor. <laughs> so I ended up I ended up watching the kids in the front yard until they got tired of playing in this little pool, and then we all sat in the living room while Tiffany and Andrea and Ben. We're in the other room uh, having this baby. <laughs> and the midwife showed up and she's like kind of late, I guess. And she's running back and forth from the car. I helped her carry some stuff. And all of a sudden, we heard the baby cry. So that was kind of neat. <laughs> and Nolan's like, I hear the baby. And he's running off. We're like, no. We grabbed his arm. 
there just in time. No, you can't come back there yet, buddy. <laughs> but all the kids were, um, Nolan, Josie, and, and Gideon were all really excited. So Ivy is her name, uh, 21 inches long and like nine something pounds, I think. Um, so anyhow. What day was that? Friday night, I believe. Eight? Was it eight seventeen or I think born eight seventeen, something like that. <laughs> but it was just yeah, first time I've been in a house. Andrea's done that twice, help people have house births, but Anything else? Anything else? Father God, we are uh, excited to be here today and excited to uh, learn about you and learn of you from your word. And Lord, just open our eyes and, and hearts uh, to hear what the leading of your Holy Spirit as we talk about uh, friendship today uh, in all our services, Lord. And uh, I just pray for Tim as he's there in that uh, fissure. And pray for Noel as she's trying to help him, and she's very restricted by the different rules. So, I, Lord, I, I just pray that uh, some of these restrictions would be lifted and removed, so that you know the foot doctor can get in there, and other specialists would be able to get in there and, and be able to care for Tim and, and the other patients there. And I'm sure this is a problem all over the state of Michigan. So. Father God, I pray for our governor and all those in leadership that they would be able to um, make some moves quickly and uh, moves that seem to me uh, to be common sense. And, and uh, so, Lord, just uh, pray for that situation, Lord, because it's out of our hands. The only thing we can ask is uh, you, you to work. Uh, Lord, we also think of Dottie and we think of her upcoming birthday and we just pray that you would bless her today and give her uh, a great day as we know she struggles with uh, various health issues and, and so watch over her give her strength she needs and uh, Lord uh, watch over our church as well as there's a number of uh, projects going on that uh, the contractors would be able to get here in a timely manner and be able to do uh, quality work and uh, just give them safety as they work on the, the building as well and um, in Jesus' name, amen. All right. All right, this morning we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hank was driving down the road when he spotted one of his friends, Charles, uh, standing out in the middle of this huge field, this huge field of grass. And he's just kind of staring up into the sky. And Hank pulls over the car to the side of the road, gets out, and he yells. But Charles is so far away, he can't hear, so he starts walking out there. And he says, hey, buddy, what are you doing? And Charles replies, I'm trying to win the Nobel Prize. Hank says, how are you trying to do that? He says, well, I heard that they give the Nobel Prize to people who are outstanding in their field. (laughs) 
One of the most important things in life is having good friends, right? A good thing Hank uh, pulled over and talked to Charles and, and checked on him. Uh, very important to have good friends. It's, it's also good to have friends that you know you can count on them that will laugh at you even when you have a dumb joke. Right? Right? Uh, well, the Bible speaks a lot about friendship, and that's what our, our series has brought us to today. Bible all over the place. I looked at a bunch of different passages, and uh, oftentimes the Greek word for friendship, and sometimes the Greek word for fellowship even, is koinonia. Has anybody ever heard that one before? I better put my glasses on. Koinonia? Yeah, that's a, it's a pretty famous uh, word in, in Greek, and it's translated friendship or fellowship, and and in our verses this morning in 1 Corinthians 10, that word koinonia is used four times. So, obviously, uh, it's going to be a very important uh, subject, and we need to highlight that. Now, this passage doesn't really highlight our friendship with each other. It highlights our friendship and fellowship with Jesus Christ. So I think that's where it really starts, and I think I emphasized that a couple weeks ago, was our, our attitudes and things and our fellowship, it all begins in our hearts. So the closer we are fellowshipping and, and friendship with Jesus Christ, the better chance we'll have uh, in fellowshipping with each other. So fellowship with Christ, uh, some of your translations may say communion with Christ. Obviously, that's, that's the most important thing in all of life. Having a close, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we need to uh, strive for, this koinonia with Jesus Christ. Now just some basics. This is pretty much review. I think we all know this. Very important to have fellowship with Christ because He's the only way to heaven. Uh, John 14, 6 is Jesus uh, is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through Him. So, very important to have that relationship with Jesus Christ because He's the only way to heaven. Uh, being a good person doesn't work. Going to church doesn't work. Giving money isn't good enough. Simply knowing who Jesus is isn't good enough. Uh, you have to place your faith in Him as the only way to heaven. Uh, our faith and hope and trust and, and pledging our lives to Him Asking Him to forgive us our sins. That, that's where it all starts. This, this koinonia with Christ. Very important for us to get to heaven. Secondly, it's important for us um, because it's how we're going to get encouragement. It's how we're going to get encouragement. Do we live in a crazy world? Yeah, I mean, um, it's a pretty crazy world we live in. At college, years ago when I was at college, one morning all of us uh, preacher boys, uh, that's what a pastor friend of mine called us, he called us preacher boys, and uh, we just completed our class Thursday morning, walk into chapel down this back sidewalk, and one of the guys said, hey, how, how did that eight page church growth paper go? How, how'd you guys do last night? Did you get it all done? And seven of us, like seven of us or so, a bunch of us, we, we look at them and we're like, what are you talking about? Well, that, that eight-page paper, it's, it's due next class. And, and we looked it up in our syllabus. Sure enough, there was an eight-page paper that the professor didn't remind us the class before, never talked about it. And major, it's an eight-page major project. And uh, we kind of all began to panic, and and we had ten. We were allowed some chapel cuts, so we all skipped chapel, and I and I typed, and I was able to get an eight-page paper completed. Um, but if it wouldn't have been for that friendship, that koinonia, where we were talking back and forth, caring about one another. Uh, we would have all failed the projects except that one guy. So, you know, as important as it is to have koinonia and fellowship and friendship with each other, that hardly compares to the importance of the koinonia uh, with Jesus Christ. 
Because when we have that, there's times when we don't even know it. But he steps in to protect us. He steps in to encourage us. He steps in and gives us this grace to us. And the thing about Jesus Christ is he's always willing to uphold his end of the bargain. He's always willing to give us encouragement and fellowship. And it just kind of falls on us sometimes, doesn't it? We have to want to seek out and desire koinonia, that fellowship with him. Very important to do that. So that's just kind of an introduction. So we're going to start reading here in 1 Corinthians 10. It's going to start reading in verse 14, if you would. It says, Therefore, my beloved, <laughs> flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. So that communion, that's koinonia. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything? Or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice... They sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship, koinonia, with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake, partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So we basically see two types of fellowships, two types of friendships, two koinonias Discuss. Now the one is with Christ, and the other is with demons. So there's possibility to have fellowship with Christ, and there's a possibility to be fellowshipping with demons. Now look at verse 15 for just a moment. Now, so Paul speaks to them as wise people. So what does that mean? Anybody want to take a guess? Paul speaks to them as wise people. Yeah, they're educated, right? These aren't stupid people. I mean, they, they, uh, they have some ability of, of wisdom of some kind. So Paul says, you need to come up with this conclusion by yourselves. So you're smart enough to do this. All right? Uh, do you want to have koinonia with Christ or koinonia with demons? Verse 16. Speaking about the communion. Uh, fellowshipping with the Lord, or sometimes we call it the Lord's table. Uh, the Lord's Supper, it's a symbolic feast, and it's, you know, a cup of grape juice and a little piece of uh, unleavened bread. But this feast it was started by Christ the night before he was killed, and uh, they all participated in this, and uh, <coughs> it's this symbolic thing a special time when we are supposed to reset. It seems like I heard one of the deacons pray that last time, where we have a reset, where we're restoring that fellowship, maybe if it's been broke, with Jesus Christ. Now, verse 17, what does the communion also help the body do? It's not, it's not just the individual getting closer to Christ. What does it do for the body, the church? Brings us back together. Yeah, it, it also... A common. Yes. So it, that, that, that communion, that meal, brings us together in unity. Okay? So we have it here the first Sunday of every month, sometimes night, sometimes in the morning. And... Uh, <clears throat> We, you know, as long as you're a born-again believer, you're saved, you're allowed to participate. And uh, we do this to remember the Lord's death. We do this to sort of reset that fellowship with Jesus Christ. And we do it because it brings us all together in unity. Have you ever gone out good buffet and you overeat? Has anybody ever done that? 
<laughs> after a meal. I mean, you go out to a buffet and you just just stuff yourself. I, I remember one time we went to is an old country buffet it used to be a thing, and Dad. It's like, I can't even walk, right? He was just so stuffed. There's different situations in my life anyway, where I sat around and had a meal with everybody, and we ate good. But I tell you what, that builds friendships, doesn't it? You're sitting around eating, you're sitting around shoveling in food, and, uh, if you can do that with somebody else, you build a friend for life. Eating, eating food with people, that really builds friendships. And this is kind of the symbolic version of that. We go into communion and we, we share that meal together, and it symbolically brings us closer together. Yes, it, it, it's that reset with Jesus Christ, but it also brings us as a church family together. And uh, yes, we don't stuff ourselves necessarily. I, I remember, uh, were you there? Uncle Jack's funeral down in Detroit, remember? Or was that before I married you? <laughs> I don't remember. So it was down in Flat Rock. And Uncle Jack, my dad's uncle, was a unique character. And when my dad and his two brothers get together, it gets a little out of control too. Well, in the Catholic religion, that that cup of the the wine or grape juice—I assume they use wine—it's been blessed. Like here, I think we can dump it back in the jug and use it next time. <laughs> there, they uh, somebody had to drink it. There was this woman, and she kept downing this huge cup of wine. And, and my uncles and my dad started making some jokes about it. Um, but, uh, you know, we have that every month. And, and we do it a little bit differently than other churches. But the point is to get us closer to Jesus Christ and closer to each other. Verse 18. Verse 18. Now that points out that Israel's sacrifice uh, provide a, a very similar uh, communion does for us today. So the Old Testament Jews, they would bring this animal to be sacrificed, and part was to be given to God, part was to be given to the priest, and the remaining part, we don't often hear this, but the remaining part was to be eaten by the family who made the sacrifice. So this was Old Testament uh, reset uh, with God, a koinonia, a fellowship with God. Um, so this is kind of uh, very similar to our symbolic feast today. Now, verse 19 talks about the other possibility. First possibility is koinonia with Christ. The second possibility is koinonia with demons. Maybe I talked too much yesterday. I didn't think I talked too much yesterday. Maybe I did. So verse 19. Um, and not, he says, What am I saying then, that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the cup of demons. What's Paul saying there? Have you ever looked at these verses? What has anybody ever taught you before about these verses? What's he saying about idols and, and false religions? You're separate. It's gotta, you can't do both. You can't do God and demons. Correct. Great. Anything else? Have you learned anything else about this passage ever before? I 
I think, I think one of the big things here is an idol is not just a rock. An idol is not just something carved out of stone or wood or, or whatever it is. Um, there's something behind it. A demon. So this would, in my opinion, extend to like some of these false religions. A demon is behind that. Uh, so these pagans that are worshiping, having their own versions of feasts and things, uh, going to their uh, false religion churches or whatever they are, they are really having fellowship with demons. And that's, that's bad, right? Um, obviously. So the logic, Paul says, verse 20, I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. You know, that seems like common sense, right? <laughs> I mean, demons are scary. Do you ever listen to guys that have these stories of maybe some kind of encounter with a demon? Like at college, all these guys would tell all these stories that they'd heard, and, and it, gets, it gets pretty scary. We were talking about demons with this super smart professor. And he was talking about demonic activity, and he was talking about witching water, uh, you know, uh, that that was demonic activity. And I raised my hand and said, that's not demonic activity. My dad taught me how to do it. And, and I'll, I'll bring in two coat hangers, and I'll, I'll prove it to you. He goes, okay. So at the next class, I brought in two coat hangers, and I put a pop can on the ground, and when I went over it, the coat hangers cross above the pop can. And these people in the class were like, <gasps> and I says, it's not demonic. If you think I'm demon possessed, give it to somebody else. So like five different people tried it, and this older guy, he was in the front row. He was just in utter disbelief. And the professor says, you come up here and do it. So he did it. And when we went above the pot can, the, the coat hangers crossed. He threw the coat hangers. The guy threw them. You know, he, he thought that was fellowshipping with demons. Where It's some kind of a natural reaction. Uh, not reaction. Natural phenomenon. I don't know the word. But demons are real. Uh, that's not demonic, but demons are real. Demons are scary. You know, I, I've heard lots of stories. One guy was witnessing <coughs> to somebody. He'd been witnessing. It was a guy at work. They worked at a pizza joint. Witnessing, witnessing, witnessing. And the guy was always resistant. And, and one night they both closed up the pizza place and they were walked into their cars, and he had been praying, I want to witness to this guy one more time, and he started sharing the, the story of Jesus, and he says the guy's eyes rolled back in his head, and he says, in a different voice, you've been doing your homework. I mean, if that happened to you, would you be scared? That'd be scary, okay? Demons are scary. I, I, have, I have no other way to say it. Okay? Because verse 20, common sense, you don't want to have fellowship with demons. I mean, they're scary, they're powerful, uh, very, very creepy. And then verse 21, as Christine mentioned, you can't do both. You can't only have koinonia with Christ or with demons. You can't I don't, you can't like switch back and forth like I'm going to do this today and that tomorrow. You have to make a decision and, and, and most people don't even make the decision. They're just following demons. They don't even realize it. You know, a very compelling reason uh, to get rid of idols in our hearts. Well, we don't worship stone or rock, but we have some other kind of idol of sin that we need to get rid of. And, and that kind of is another thing that we do at the Lord's table. We get rid of that sin and we pursue Christ. Um, <clears throat> where is this? I have a quote in here, but... 
Oh yeah, here it is. I'm just it's the whole this whole section. So a uh, famous preacher, this is what he said about idols. I really liked it. He said, anything that substitute for God in your life is an idol. Anything that takes precedence over God is an idol. Uh, for some people, I suppose that could be a girlfriend. I mean, I've seen some people totally abandon all their Christian testimony for the sake of some girl that they fall in love with, and vice versa. And, and uh, he goes on and, and talks about uh, people uh, pursuing the wrong thing and, and getting away from Jesus Christ, that fellowship with Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says, we don't want to do that. We want to stick with fellowship with Jesus. It could be money. You know, some people have that idol set up. They bow down to the shrine of money. They worship money. You know, the biggest thing in their life is to make money. I, I was talking to somebody on the phone Friday night, and he says, well, growing up, I, I, I didn't have much. My parents didn't have much. So it's, it's my goal to become rich. And, you know, you know, if that's the biggest thing in your life, where's the fellowship? Is it with the, the money? Uh, materialism? You know, new house, different car, and nice clothes. And, and, you know, you go down that path and you're getting away from Jesus Christ, that fellowship with Jesus Christ. Some people, it's, it's education. So they get this degree and that degree and that certificate, and, and they think, oh, i got to have all this, all this stuff. And all it does is just draw us away from Jesus Christ. Could be sports. A lot of people like sports. This year, it's one of those years I've pretty much given up on all sports. But some people, they, they chase that little white ball around. Some people do it on Sundays. You know, are they worshiping that little white ball? You know, all these different things you can, can do. Get away from Jesus Christ. And he says, no, you can't do both. Anything that sits God in our lives takes priority over Jesus, that's an idol. Verse 14, flee from idolatry. Free, flee from idolatry because you want that koinonia with God. You don't want that koinonia with God. So I really like how Paul is starting this discussion on friendship and he's giving us the choice. Uh, what's your fellowship and friendship going to be with? It's going to be with God or it's going to be with demons? Verse 22. Didn't really mention that one yet. What's that? What's that verse talking about? Verse 22, any, anybody want to guess? And what, when you do that, what, what's God's reaction? Jeal jealousy, yeah, thank you, Andrew. Jealousy. So, we can do something that provokes God to jealousy. Very interesting. So when we see this, we see God doesn't like rivals in worship. God doesn't like others to receive glory that should go to Him. God doesn't like it when we make things and plans and people more important than Him. He's a jealous God. And if our fellowshipping is, is with something other than Jesus Christ... Because I wanted one for the, the top of my truck. And Willie says, oh, order me a few. And, and they ran on batteries rather than plugging in so you didn't have to worry about them. So we got them in the mail or whatever, and I put batteries in them. And it was kind of late at night, and me and the kids drove out there. And I says, hey, let's put them all over Willie's truck and turn them on. And my kids were like, yeah, let's do it. And then one of them said, well, can we get some toilet paper and wrap his truck up with toilet paper and just trash his truck? I'm like, I'm yes. like, guys, you can do that. 
but I know Willie, and Willie's really big, and uh, Willie's stronger than you guys, and I says, I don't want Willie to fill up his, his manure spreader and back it up to my car and turn it on. And, and my kids actually asked Willie, manure on my daddy's car <laughs> and he's like I don't know what I do but know that if you do something to me I'm gonna get you back and it's gonna be worse so you know the point is don't play jokes on people unless you're bigger or stronger than them right um, and that's exactly what verse 22 is pointing at are we stronger than God why would we want to provoke God? Like I'm trying to talk to my kids. Don't provoke Willie, okay? <laughs> Please. So Paul says the same thing. Are we stronger than God? So why would we provoke him by going after demons? By going after something that is, is not pleasing to God, as Carrie said. Listen to Nahum. This is talking about God. It's really neat. The mountains quake before him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at his presence. Yes, the world that all who dwell in it. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. That's pretty powerful, God. Why would we want to provoke God? I mean, mountains quake before him. Man, that's, that's pretty serious. I like that word, heaves. <laughs> the earth heaves. I mean, we need to consider that. You know, when we're, when we're uh, even when we do communion once a month, we need to consider boy, God can do that. That's where our koinonia needs to be. That's where our fellowship and friendship needs to be with Jesus Christ. You know, when our attention is pulled different ways, when our attention is given to other things that displease God, you know, it, it provokes them in some way. I don't, I don't know how serious the reaction is going to get. But we got to go back to God. Respect His power and authority. Fear God. You know, separation from sin and, and worshiping the Lord, very, very important. So, any thoughts or questions? Any comments? I need to keep that. So, going back to the idolatry and things that take you away from the Lord, does that have to be something that's consistent and continual, or can it be like a seasonal thing? I. Like a seasonal thing, like every year at the same time you go back to it? I mean, you refer to if it's something that takes you away from fellowship, or what if it's a boat? Sure, could be. Is that idolatry? Could be. It could be anything. Like I mentioned, the little white ball could be a boat. It could be a motorcycle. It could Pardon me? It could be sleep. Yeah, you know, anything that, yes. Now, obviously, these all these individuals that it could be, or us, I don't know their hearts, but yes. Idols can be anything. I think that's clear from Scripture. I think we often look at, like, verse 22 uses the word jealousy, and I think we look at jealousy in that term in a way that our our interpretation of jealousy is not the way that it is it is used here I, th I think we look at it differently you know I was thinking you know when we do things are we is it worth the reaction, the consequence from God, and the joking thing with Willie, and it's very true, we grew up knowing, and my kids grew up knowing, you can mess with them, but just be ready for, and I, I wrote down, the realignment of who is more powerful, and I, you know, forget the Willie thing, but, you know, are we ready for, when we make decisions contrary to God, are we ready for the realignment of power? 
Mm. Because if we are children of God, if we, you know, we do the same thing as parents, you know, at some point we let, we let our kids make decisions, but then at some point we realign the power or the authority. You know, we are your parents. That's enough. Now we're going to, you know, we realign. And I think sometimes we, we, you know, one, one, of the, one of the fruits of the spirits is long-suffering. And God is long-suffering. But at some point, he realigns who's more powerful, what the, what the order of authority is. Mm -hmm. And where we should fall in line with them. And we 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 make mistakes, we make wrong choices, we you know and sometimes the Lord is more long suffering than at other times, but there is going to be a realignment. Yeah, good good way to put it. Thank you. Yeah, a realignment of power. I like that. Any other thoughts? And you are fundamentally because you're right. alive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could be watching it for sure. Yeah. Uh, I didn't ask him for that permission, but I knew he wouldn't care on that story. So, um, I actually, in my, in my notes, I just had, uh, I actually gave it to Andrea. It just was one line, don't play jokes on people bigger or stronger than you. <laughs> I I figured you I was know, gonna we, wing it. We do that with you know, I love time I don't mean to since we became parents a lot of times I I, I look at our relationship with Christ and the and the parental figure. You know, and sometimes even I do it. I know the consequences to my action. And I choose the action knowing because in my mind, in my distorted mind and you know, and sometimes in our in our children's mind, and even this morning we have with, with with the animals, it's like there's consequences to your actions. But they, you know, we as humans, we still chose. We choose the we choose the action, knowing the consequence. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's why sometimes we need more resets than just once a month.